I, I just want to touch on what Tiffany said about shouting. How many people in here are shouters by nature? All right, there's a couple. I am not a shouter at all. We were at the Yankee game. Somebody hit a home run, and I was like, that's good. <laughs> you know, so when you make that statement, what would you do if your team won? Well, if everybody was like me, they would win, the, and, and they would just say in their heart, they'd be real happy they won, but there's no shouting. I sat in my seat. Everybody else was up. Now, now here's the other side. If you won the lottery, what would you do? Some people would shout. I'd probably cry. <laughs> if somebody came in here and said, here's $10 billion, I see all your vision, just do it. I wouldn't go, woo! I would, it's not in me. I would just get on my knees and just worship God and cry my eyes out. So, amen. But I'm saying this to make a point. There's a time to shout even if you're not a shouter. There's a shout that comes by faith where you shout. There's a time to dance if you're not a dancer. There's a time to do this stuff because it, the word says so. And there is a time to get humble and quiet before God and cry. So wherever you're at, don't feel guilty if you're not a shouter. Shout by faith. And if you're the kind of person that likes to shout all the time, well, once in a while, be quiet. <laughs> and then we got it all covered. The one thing we got to make sure is that we're all on the same page. That's very important. You know, one thing as I've been pressing into the things of God, the love of God is just so awesome. I don't care if you're going through anything. You, you don't have enough money to go do what you're doing. I don't care if you're going through things physically. There's something that always brings me comfort, something that always brings... Just, just go back and tap into the love of God. Because when He loves you, nothing else really matters, man. It just doesn't. Amen. I just want to take a moment. Is Rachel still here? Did she go downstairs? She's with the kids, huh? All right, well, we'll pray for Rachel. She's going to college. I can't believe this. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they come in here little, they go to college, and then they, ugh, it's amazing. Jacqueline's back already. It's in, it's in, time keeps going. We need time. Um, if, if Rachel's here at the end of the service, we will pray with her as a group. But if not, I want to personally lay hands on her and pray for her. So we will do that. Don't let me forget. Amen. One of the things, what would you say? Girl, you're going back too, huh? Well, you, you're just like a lifetime learner, though. So it's <laughs> just study things just for the sake of studying how many people here don't do that? <laughs> Some people love to learn. I mean, I love to learn, but I, I like experience. Books get in my way. <laughs> Amen. Every once in a while, you get to a place in your life where you, where you bump into a roadblock whether it's in your marriage, in your job, in your finances, in church, in your spiritual growth, you, you get to a place where you just can't seem to move forward. So I want to give you some practical steps to help you move forward through some of these situations. And, and before I do that, I want you to be aware of something. Some of the things that I'm about to share are not necessarily popular in the church world. When I say the church world, I'm not talking about our church, I'm talking about Christians in general throughout the world. And one of the things we need to be aware of is a strategy for war is to divide and conquer. If you could take, if you had to fight a, a hundred people and you had ten, you would probably lose. But if there was a way to pick one off and then 10 of you had to fight that one, it's an easy victory. So we need to understand that, first of all, in our nation, the devil understands this strategy very well to divide us. 
And the divide, I don't think, ever in the history of our country has been so severe. And you need to understand, along with this divide, there are spirits at work behind this. And, and what happens is, usually one side is more susceptible to these spirits than the other. It's interesting when you see a liquor store, they refer to liquor as spirits. For those of you that didn't always live for Christ, and you partake, partook, whatever word, partaken, you drank some of these spirits, <laughs> you notice it did something to you. You hear this phrase, he's a mean drunk. Guess what? Guess what kind of drunk I was when I had a few drinks? I was mushy. I love you, man. I just always wanted to tell you I love you, man. Just, you're my friend. Surprised, I'm sure. There are spirits that as you drink them, as you yield to them, the main thing that they put inside of you is division and divisiveness and arguing. Do not take the bait. Why do I say that? Because I read Facebook and some of you are taking the bait. I put a post once. I said, all I have to do is write the word politics and there's an argument. And it wouldn't be me arguing. I just put it on my site and all of a sudden somebody posted, yeah, well, this and this. And there's an argument on my page that I'm not a part of. <laughs> Sometimes staying silent might be the best solution. So we see that a, a strategy against the church is to divide us. But we also see the Bible makes it very clear that the opposite is true. The Bible says one will put a thousand to fly, two put ten thousand to fly. We see when they were in the upper room and they were in one accord that God moved in a mighty way. So we see the, the, how critical it is that we're in unity. So I'm saying all this because as you start walking in some of the things that I'm sharing with you, there are some people in the church world even that will attack you for it. We have been called names as blab it, grab it, confess it, possess it. What was the other one? There's one more. Name it, claim it. Those prosperity teachers, those making it sound like we're saying that as long as you become a Christian, you'll never have a problem in your whole life. And that's not what we're saying. One thing that I realized, because I did it, <clears throat> people tend to listen to what people say and never try to verify if what they said is in fact true. Because I hated a whole bunch of preachers, bad-mouthed, gossiped, defamed, slandered, preachers because somebody else told me what they said and never heard it for myself. And when someone says, just listen and tell me what you disagree with, when I listened, I was like, I'm in total agreement. Why have I been so mad at these guys? Because somebody who was motivated by one of these spirits spoke to me. I heard those words which is no different than drinking something that affects you. One goes in your mouth, one goes in your ear. Those spirits, I yielded to them. I yielded to division. The Bible says where there's strife, all manner of evil is present. I yielded to this and became bitter towards people that loved me and had no problem with me. And it was all based on a lie. So I searched the scriptures and became one of them. This is what God gave me. This is what God put in my heart as I was praying about going further in our church, <clears throat> about going further in my personal walk. And by the way, you need to hear what I'm about to say. The church cannot go further if you're not going further personally. You, you need to get that. Everybody comes to a place in their walk, depending on how much you 
feel you needed or appreciated your salvation. The Bible says those who are forgiven much are thankful much. I was very thankful and I continue to be very thankful. So my thing was I was lost. I was on my way to hell. Jesus Christ took my sin, didn't require anything from me at all. He died on that cross, took all of my sin, and forgave every last one of them. I'm grateful. So what is it that he can ask me to do that I'm going to argue with? As I came to Christ, everything I read, I remember reading about baptism. I was like, it's in there. I, I need to do this. I need to do it now. I have to do this. The Bible says so. I've told you this before. Art, of those of you who know Artie Gardella, he's this big. I picked him up and put him up. I said, what do I got to do to be baptized? Who has to baptize me? He said, any believer could baptize you. I said, well, when do we do it? Anytime you need. I grabbed him and I put him on his shoulder. I said, we're going now. And I had him and he was kicking. I said, he goes, just wait. We're going to have a service like we're going to have. It's special. It's okay. You can wait. Now, some people believe unless you're baptized, you're going to go to hell. Baptism is a symbol of what you've done. It's nothing, it doesn't do anything to forgive your sins. The blood does. And if you're going to get baptized, we'll have a class for you on, on that. But as I came to Christ, when I read about tithing, I didn't even question it for a split second. I said, what is it? It's 10% of everything you earn. Okay, next that's how I came to Christ. What else? Love walk? Love, pray for those who persecute me? Oh my goodness, that ain't going to work. I'm going to get abused. Do good to those who are mean to you? I can't see how this is going to work. If, if he tries to steal my money and I'm nice to him, he'll just keep stealing my money. That's the way I have grew up. They're just You don't let people take advantage of you. But guess what? I said, Lord, if your word says do it, I'll do it. Even if everybody takes advantage of me, I'll do it. Guess what happened when I started loving people? They stopped taking advantage of me. They were actually doing nice things for me. I won my enemies over. There was a few people, I didn't even know why I was fighting with them for you. We can't even remember where the fight started from. And after I started talking, I'm like, he's a nice guy. But every time we passed each other, I was like, ah, you idiot, blah, you know, just because, for no reason. I just knew I didn't like him, and I didn't know why. Don't, don't look at me like that, you've done it. But everybody gets to a place where, where something more is required of you that's hindering your growth. Everyone, including myself, as much as I say I love God, there's things that I know I need to do on a regular basis that doesn't come naturally to me. Like I said, studying is not something that comes naturally to me. When, when, the, when the going gets tough, I roll up my sleeves. When I sometimes should be putting these things aside, grabbing my Bible, getting alone with God and say, I don't care about those things. You know, Tony said this. He goes, the problem is you know how, many, how to do too many things. If I didn't know how to do them, I'd have to wait until somebody did them. But since I know how to do them and they're not getting done, I'll do them. At the expense, at times, of, of what I should have been doing more in the work. Listen, I'm just being real with you. Where are you and what is it in your life that's stopping you from going forward in the Lord and growing? If God told you to fast, I need you to fast for three days every month. Every month. And if that's what he told you to do, and you can't put your fork down, you're going to hinder your growth. Because that's where he told you to be. If he told you not to miss church, and you're like, well, i got to work. I'd have to get a new job. Listen, whatever it is he told you to do, you need to do it if you want to grow. If you don't, you're stuck where you're at. You've reached the water level and you're done. And when a whole church reaches that level, the church as a whole is not going to grow. So we have to get into a season where we're all saying, what can I do to grow personally? And don't set goals that are just, 
so unrealistic that you feel guilty that you're failing all the time. Set realistic goals, something that you can do and keep forward, keep going forward. So this is what the Lord spoke to me as I was looking at my own life to see, okay, God, and, and I have these conversations with the Lord on a regular basis. Okay, I might have been busy and working, I'm just checking in. What do I need to do? And the area he checked in my life and revealed to me in my life, I'm going to share with you because I, I, I know where you're at also. This is what he spoke to me. He said, you could only go in your life as far as your words allow. You can only go as far in life as far as your words allow. So what I'm going to do today, first of all, is look at some scriptures that help you to understand that statement, show you that it is in fact a principle that's in the Word of God. These men and Brother Hagen didn't make this up. It's in the scriptures. Brother Hagen didn't read or, or write or is not the author of Mark 11.23. He was on his sick bed with several things in his life that would have killed him if one didn't, the other wouldn't. And when he read Mark 11:23 and put it into practice, he was raised off his sick bed. And God's not a respecter of persons. What Brother Hagen did for when he was in need of healing, you can do when you're in need of anything. Grab the word, believe it and speak it. It's in the Bible. Let's go ahead and read that scripture one more time. Mark eleven twenty three. This is true in every area of your life. Thank you. It's true in your marriage. Your marriage won't go as far as your words allow it to. If you're constantly speaking negative about each other, you are cursing your marriage. You're limiting how far your marriage can go. Your finances. We're going to look into these a little bit further. Healing, prosperity, everything, your words are going to dictate how far you're going to go in every one of those areas. By the way, this is true whether you're a Christian or not. It is more so for the Christian. But if you're a negative person, if you don't know the Lord, you keep saying, I can't do anything, I'm a failure, I'm no good. Listen, they have seminars all over the place that basically have taken the principles in the Bible... I don't have to be a Christian to have the law of gravity to work. If I step off the building, I'm going down. My brother tried it. Thank God it, it was miraculous. He's doing okay. But gravity works whether you're a believer or not. The principles of your, the words of your mouth work whether you're a Christian or not. But more so for the Christian... Because the words we start speaking are God's word, the Bible. And when we speak his word, he said he's faithful to make sure that what we're saying comes to pass. So we, it, it's, it's one of the foundation major points in Christianity, our words. If you're a Christian, that's how you came to be a Christian. By your words, confessing what you believe. And why would there be such an argument over this when it's so clear that that is the very way that you came to know Christ? Why would it be so surprising that if God made that the system and, and the requirement to, to get to know Him, that that would be the same system and requirement to receive everything else from Him? The Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says this, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. This is scripture. This tells me that I have to say something. I have to say something that I believe in my heart, not in my head. And that when I do say and believe what's in my heart, that it will happen. It will be done for me. This is scripture. So what do we need to do? Find out what the scriptures have to say. Not what any preacher says on radio, not what your mommy and daddy taught you, not what any pastor told, nothing. What does the scripture say? 
It's up to you to be a student of the scripture to find out for yourself. Even what I'm telling you today to find out if it's true or not. First we're going to look at some of the scriptures that talk about negative words. You don't have to turn there, Proverbs 18.21. It gives a description of both positive or negative words. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That makes it very clear that your words are very powerful and very important. Let's go to James 3.3. 3. Let's look at this one more time. We've looked at this before. I want to point out a few things. Remind you if you know. If you don't know, you're being taught. If you do know, you're being reminded. Because we're going to get to a place, if, if you're really honest with yourself, you ask yourself, how, how is, what, what have my words been declaring? By the way, whether you realize it or not, your words declare what you believe. No question about it. The Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So your mouth is constantly revealing what's in your heart. If you were to record yourself and play it back and really examine what you're saying. And if everything, let me just ask you this question. If everything you said came to pass, where would your life be? I mean, God's having mercy on you, not letting Mark 20, 11, 23 come to pass in your life. Because that headache would have killed you by now. I got a headache, it's killing me. I don't know what to do. How many times you say that one? If that actually came to pass, you would never know what to do. So you got to watch your words. James 3.3. 3, it says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, just, again, just as you're reading scriptures, don't read them so fast. Sometimes you have to read different versions just to shake yourself because you read it so many times you miss things. This says that the ship is driven by a strong wind. So this is telling me that when my life is being driven by a strong wind, when there's an impossible situation that I can't seem to face, the rudder that's going to change in the middle of the strong wind, the, the rudder is my tongue. That's going to change the direction of where I'm going. That's what this says. I'm not making this up. I'm not reading into it. It says, All they there are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. I'm going to read verse 5 in the Message Bible. It says, A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. First, I want you to notice what this says about a small spark. It doesn't take a bomb to light a fire. It takes a small spark. So what I'm reading in this is the words that you think that are coming out of your mouth that may seem insignificant or not that big of a deal is enough of a spark to set your life in a direction where you have a forest fire of problems. Don't like that one? <laughs> Listen, I've given it to you away and it hurt me also. So The Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If, if, if you want to find out where the problems are in your life, you, you're, the, the answer literally is but no, you're right beneath your nose. It, it's right there. In verse 6, it says, The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Let's just stop right there. How can my tongue be a world of evil? Well, if my mind hasn't been renewed, and I'm just speaking whatever I want without putting a filter on it, and without renewing my mind, what comes out of your mouth 
naturally is negative. Your body, your life, your tongue, your way of doing things, because we're in a fallen world, is automatically set on negative. If, let me give you a better picture. If I'm driving uphill and put my car in neutral and let go of the brake, which way am I going to go? Backwards. That's your life. In order, order to go forward, you have to do something. You have to have the fuel in the car, the engine has to be running, you have to put it in drive, and you have to get, let go of the brake and give it gas to make progress uphill. That's Christianity. You try to coast and put it in neutral, you're going backwards. Well, as soon as something happens, the first things out of your mouth are knee-jerk reaction until you renew your mind is going to be negative. Until you renew your mind with the word and you think like God thinks, then all of a sudden, the first thing out of your mouth, you've trained yourself to be positive. Verse 6, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by what? By hell. The devil knows this. The devil knows if he can get your tongue, he's got you. But he doesn't really go after your tongue because first he has to go after your mind. If he can get you negative in your mind, negative will come out of your mouth and then you're done. The Bible says we're created in God's image and likeness. God created the heavens and earth by speaking them. Amen. We're created as his children to operate like he did. Amen. So if the devil can get our tongue and get us to curse our own life, he's got to get us to have a wrong picture of who God is first of all. A wrong mental picture of who God is and what he said he would do. And what he actually promised. Because if he could lie to us about what he promised, about God not doing healing today that had passed away with the apostles, if he gets us to believe that in our head, and we believe that in our heart, guess what? It comes out of our mouth. This will change our church. This will change the course of your life if you really listen to what I'm saying. In the Message Bible, verse 6, a careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can, can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. The Bible is making it very clear that your words are very more important than you really even realize. Some of the examples we see, first of all, how many times did God promise that he would bring them to the promised land? How specific was he with those promises? He said, go get the land that I have already given you. You know, there's times in our life we don't know what the will of God is and we're struggling. They knew the will of God clearly. They didn't have to wonder, am I struggling because I'm going in the wrong direction? Am I out of the will of God? No, they knew the will of God. And instead of just going to do it, because God said do it, they sent out spies to see if they can do it. That was the first mistake. And then when they saw giants, we have Joshua and Caleb saying, we can still do this. But you had ten of the twelve spies saying, we can't do this. And, and again, I'm not going into that whole teaching today, I can't, but it's pretty awesome. Because what, what the ten said was, we are like grasshoppers in their sights. And if you read the account of what they were saying, they were like, we were ready to run. When we heard you were coming, it says, our hearts melt like wax within us. We heard that you conquered them, we heard that you conquered them, and you were coming for us. We were scared. And yet ten of them came away thinking, we can't do this. And, and, and they, they look at us as little nothings that they could just wipe us away. And that was an unclear picture. And yet they let that fear stop them. What does it say? They murmured against God. They mur murmured against their leader. It was an 11-day journey from the time they were delivered 
Not to mention how they were delivered and the miracles God did that should have shored them up to say, well, if he did that, we can get into the promised land. With all that behind them, they murmured. An 11-day journey from there to the promised land took them 40 years because they murmured. Some of the victories in your life are being withheld because of your tongue and your murmuring. Okay, we'll keep going. In, in Matthew, and, and I'm, I'm running low on time, so I'm, I'm going to go a little quicker. In Matthew 13, 54, talks about Jesus going back to his own country. First it says he taught them in their synagogue. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he taught them. They were astonished. You can be astonished and still not get into faith. But then they said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty words? They were still on the right track to a certain degree, but then this is where they missed it. Is this not the carpenter's son? Isn't he just one of us? He thinks he's special, but he's not. That's basically what they were saying. And in verse 57, the later part, it says, But Jesus said to them, A prophet is without honor except in his own country and his own house. And then what does it say about Jesus here? Be again, we're looking at, as they're saying these things, it's revealing what's in their heart. They didn't esteem Jesus for who he was. It came out. And it says, he, now he did not do mighty works there because of what? Their unbelief. And their unbelief came out of their mouth. And it hindered him. All the miracles he's doing all over the place, people being healed, Blind eyes open, lepers healed. He couldn't do it in his own town because of one reason. And, and, and people will argue with this. They will, they will accuse us of being unloving because they'll put words in our mouth that says that we said that they didn't get healed because they didn't have enough faith. Well, let me ask you a question. If you're not getting healed because you don't have enough faith, is it loving not to say it or to tell you? Is this the reason that Jesus did not do mighty works in his own town because of their own unbelief? It's in the Bible. So if you're not experiencing victory, I would suggest this is the first place you look. And in a world where on the radio and songs and everything are preaching and teaching and singing unbelief, it's hard to get in faith. You're fighting an uphill battle. You're fighting a spiritual atmosphere, even in the church, that's pretty negative. We see, on the other hand, that there's positive examples. The woman with the issue of blood. It says, when she heard about Jesus, how does faith come? By hearing and hearing by the word of God. She heard who Jesus was. She heard what he did. And then she did what? For she said... She believed and she spoke. She did Mark eleven twenty three. She said, if I could only touch his clothes, I shall be made well. She was healed. And then Jesus asked, who touched me? And they all said, everybody touched you. But he knew somebody touched her with faith. And then, the, then verse 33 says this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened in her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter... It's a good thing you came to me because I have so much faith it healed you. It's not what it says. It says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So we hear that expression once again about God being in control. If Jesus was in control, she would have been healed by his faith. If she didn't have faith, she wouldn't have been healed. So Jesus was not in control of her healing. She was. Jesus is not in control of your life unless you stand on the word and you get in agreement with him and give him control. We also see blind Bartimaeus as Jesus came by. As I read this story, it says, As he went into Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. 
Again, we're talking about how important words are. We're talking about how words reveal what's in your heart. It said when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, he began to cry out. Picture this. He's sitting there begging for food, just waiting for the day that Jesus comes by. He didn't say, it's Jesus of Nazareth, and then say, who is it? No, he, he said, as soon as he heard, it was Jesus of Nazareth. Listen, I'll tell you what, I'm not a shouter, but if I was stuck or blind or my kids needed something, I would shout. There are times to shout. Blind Bartimaeus just starts shouting. The disciples say, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. That's what people are going to tell you when you start shouting. That's what people are going to tell you when you start confessing the word of God and make fun of you and call you names. But when Jesus turned around and said, bring him to me, the same people that were telling him to shut up said, be of good cheer. <laughs> the master calls you. They were just telling him to shut up. In verse 49, Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Guys, listen. Jesus is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. When you call out by faith, like blind Bartimaeus did, Jesus will do for you what he did for him. What does it say? So Jesus stood still. In this crowd of everybody who had needs, I'm sure they had financial needs. I'm sure their kids were sick. I'm sure every need that we had was represented there. But as Jesus is walking through this crowd of needs, somebody got his attention and caused him to stop. I'm telling you how to get the attention of God and cause him to stop and take notice of your situation. It's by faith. Cry out, Jesus, have mercy on me. Whatever it is you need. Then they called the blind man saying, be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. Throwing aside his garment, and boy, you can do a whole teaching on this. That's how he made a living. Basically gave up his job, and he rose to came to Jesus. He didn't say, hold on to this in case it don't work. He threw it away. I don't need this anymore. That was his faith. The Bible says faith without works is dead. That was his works. He was sure he was going to be healed. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I may receive sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. My goodness, it's 12 o'clock. I'm going to have to continue another time. The part where I get to the end about how to watch your words. I mean, I'll say it now, and then we'll come back to it another time and get into it further. But you have a gas gauge on the car. What is that an indication of how much gas you have? We look at that gauge. If it's on E, do we keep driving? No, we stop for gas to refuel. Yet, as Christians, when our spiritual gas gauge is empty, we just keep going. You get in trouble. You'll never have victory. If you were going from here to Florida, would you go on one gas tank? Not a chance. You have to refuel to keep going. And refueling from Sunday to Sunday is not a place of victory. It's not going to bring you into victory. The, the manna was daily. You have a food gauge in your body. You take care of that one real well. <laughs> Enough said. We'll go back to that one next time. I, I'm going to end there, but I I'm, I'm, want to encourage you. I just want to repeat that statement again. First, I'm going to say, after reading these scriptures, and I'm not done yet, you can only go as far as, as your words allow. And I want you to be more mindful of your words. 
You know, one of the things, you know, my wife says, well, are you saying that by faith? Keith Moore did a teaching on relationships, and he said this. He said, sometimes I just drive down the street, and for no reason at all, I'll just start saying, I love my wife. I, I love my wife. Thank you, Lord, for my wife. I have done that over the years. You want your marriage to get better? My wife's a pain in the neck. She's just such a... Oh, I can't believe it. What does it say? You have what you say. Women. <laughs> My husband's a slob. You're going to have... That was the guy's voice, by the way. <laughs> What's your first reaction when you go to pay bills and there's not enough money in your bank account? Is your bank account your provider or is God your provider? What comes out of your mouth? What's the first thing that comes out of your mouth? What's the first thing that grips your heart when you don't have enough money? Is it, oh, no. No, that's not faith. There's gauges in your life you need to be looking at. What's the first thing that happens when you get a bad report from the doctor? Does fear grip you? That's not faith. Can you, can you switch that around quickly? Absolutely. Absolutely. You could start out in fear and switch it to faith. I know when it comes to forgiveness... Many of you have a pretty good handle on it. Many of you, when you blow it, and blow it big, God, I'm sorry. That, that's really as much faith as it takes. You don't have to keep begging God. You don't keep finding scriptures. You just, God, I'm sorry. And because you know his character, you say, well, I'm forgiven. And you walk away. And you're forgiven. It should be that way with every other area. It should be that way when it comes to you forgiving others. I love them, but I don't have to like them. <laughs> no, you, you, that's bitterness. It's there. It'll destroy you. You need to have enough faith to forgive somebody else as you do to receive forgiveness yourself. When someone says, I'm sorry, it needs to be as done with them as it is when you ask for forgiveness. My God, my God, my God. I want to give you an opportunity. You can stand to your feet if you're here today.